Friends, we have a guest tonight that's going to bring the word to us. Pastor Mark. Mark is with Florida Faith Church, and you might have noticed there's been a lot of new faces around. And if you're from Florida Faith Church tonight, would you raise your hand, please? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grace Wesley, and I would ask that after service, y'all take the time to meet these folks, welcome them, give them a hug if they'll take it, and if they won't, that's okay. But let them know they're welcome in this place, and tonight their pastor, Mark, is going to bring us the word. Mark? All right. Good evening. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here. I have to tell you, we are genuinely humbled. It's been a long time for Florida Faith Church. We've uh, been around for seven years, and uh, we've always talked about having a Christ-centered, kingdom-focused congregation that is theologically sound. And then Pastor Myron and I bumped heads, and from there, <laughs> we just went forward, and it is so exciting and truly a privilege to be here, and so I thank you all for for having us. And before we begin, we do this every week at uh, Florida Faith Church, and I'd like to do it here as well. This is the time of the week that we wait for. And so what I'd like to do is have everybody take a long, deep breath. And when we breathe in, we're going to breathe in the love and peace and grace and beauty of God of Jesus Christ. And when we breathe out, you're going to breathe out all of those things that are coming between you and your Lord. This is the time of the week we wait for, where we can just worship. So let's take a big deep breath in, four seconds. It's time to get some words from the Lord. In my house, we have an 11-year-old daughter. Her name's Gloria. You probably saw her running around here, and she's writing on the board in the back. She wrote that welcome for everybody here in the back. And uh, she has an Advent calendar. How many of you have an Advent calendar? Oh, come on, church. Really? Oh, you guys. An Advent calendar. I mean, the kids wait for it all year, right? It counts down 25 days until Santa's coming. And she told me before I came here, she said, Daddy, it's nine days away. Nine days. She's got it down to the hours. And she's got a special Advent calendar this year. Day one on her Advent calendar, you know, you open it up and you get a, you usually, you get a toy or you get a piece of chocolate. Oh, she got a toy. Did she get a toy? She got a Barbie. Yeah. Barbie was in a bathing suit when she got her Advent calendar. And then each day of the Advent calendar, you know, the days are numbered. Each day of the Advent calendar, you open up and you count down a day, and she gets a different piece for Barbie. She's got a watch. She's got a dress. She's got this. I mean, she's, Barbie's looking good these years. Yeah. And I tell you, I was super lucky this year because I got an Advent calendar. I couldn't believe it. And that's super special because, you know, Advent calendars, days are numbered. Oh, man, really? You're going to let the joke? I mean, first joke, nothing? Yeah, all right. You got, who got it? A couple people? Thank you. At least a couple people got it. Hey, we're in the third week of Advent. And in the third week of Advent, we are getting ready. We're getting ready for the Christ child. And each week, we're lighting candles and we're focusing on things like hope and love and joy and peace. And so the first week, we talked about God being faithful in our anticipation and the preparation of the Christ child. And last week, we heard in Mark, we heard from Pastor Cindy in Mark, you remember this, right? The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, John the baptizer, getting ready for the Christ child. And you know, Advent is not just a time for anticipation. It is a time for activation. 
actively living out the missional teachings of Jesus Christ, obeying his commands. And so today we're in the third week, and I want to talk to you about talking the walk. And that means prayer. Prayer is communication with God. In the season of anticipation, we look in one of our scriptures from today in 1 Thessalonians. The main theme is Jesus' second coming in 1 Thessalonians and how we prepare our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and souls to be holy and blameless in our lives. And if anyone's been coming to our Revelation Bible study, you know, we getting close. He may come any time. Life is about knowing God. Life is about walking with God. And when you read your Bible, you know, this canon of 66 books written by 40 authors over 2,000 years in three different continents and three different languages that says the same thing, when you read your Bible, You're understanding God. It's about being with God. But when we pray, it's about talking with God. In one of the gospel readings for today, we see an interaction with Mary, mother of Jesus, talking to Elizabeth. Mother of John the Baptist, did you know they were cousins? And Mary says in Luke 1, 4, she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Mary clearly had a fervent prayer life. A lot of us are intimidated by prayer. We have this misunderstanding of, of what prayer is, and I speak to you from experience because certainly if you're in one of your small groups or in your Bible studies or something, or if we're having pizza together and I say, who's going to pray? Everyone goes like this. Woo. And then I hear, well, you're the pastor. Pray for the pepperoni or do something. Right? So I want to share with you how prayer works, the principles of prayer, and what God expects from prayer. I got an idea. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this worship service. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts is pleasing to you, O Father, our rock and our redeemer. We pray that all of your messages here, whether spoken or unspoken, are experienced by everyone. And Father God, now I ask you to pull me out of this service, Lord. May your words be my words. Speak in and through me. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's children say, Amen. 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 Uh, hey, when I was in uh, seminary, I came back <clears throat> and... Uh, I was, I was pretty green when I went to, to seminary. I was in my 40s. And I came back, and, uh, and I wanted to get close to as many of those people with those, those long, giant robes, you know that fancy stuff that they wear? And I walked into uh, someone's office who I held in pretty high regard, and I was telling her about my seminary experience. And I said, I have so many questions, right? You feel my pain, Cindy? Oh, I got so many questions. And she said, well, bring it. I said, would you teach me how to pray? Huh? I don't think she knew how to handle that. I wanted to learn how to pray. I said, I, 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 I must be missing something. And that is an unusual question. I mean, you figure if, a, if you're a Christian, I mean, you would, you would know how to pray. We're supposed to be praying all the time, right? 
And certainly if you're a seminarian and, and you're doing a Masters of Divinity, you're going to come out and be a pastor. You should know how to pray. So guess what? <laughs> she taught me. Yeah, she taught me. I walked out of her office with 15 DVDs set. <laughs> yeah, true story. True story. So I'm in seminary, the very first class, and uh, I went to Wesley Seminary. You sit in a square like this. You know, the professor's right in the middle. And uh, this was for the intensive part of it. So we were there, this, this first one. Uh, so you're going, you're going to be with these people for four years. And there's 23 of us sitting around in a, in a square like this. And the class is eight hours, the very first class. And we get in the class and every, yeah, I know. Right? And we get in the class and everyone goes and they introduce himself around and we're, we're talking about where we come from and what our churches are like and all those kind of things. And then he says, okay, it's 12 o'clock. Um, hey, Mark, <laughs> why don't you pray us out? Oh, okay. It sounded something like this. Lord Jesus, the higher and mighty, thee, thy, thou, this, thou, thou. Every word I could, the biggest, those long words that are about this long in the Bible, took every one of those I could throw out. <laughs> threw them out. And I finished. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The pastor, his name's Wayne Schmidt, by the way, said, okay. <laughs> lunch you know <laughs> everyone's going out the door everyone's going out the door and I'm getting my backpack and getting ready to go and I could just feel them behind me <laughs> excuse me uh Mark yeah could I could I see you just for a minute I said, sure he said we've been here for four hours I said yeah your first day in class I said yeah he said, and you told us how you're from Fort Lauderdale. You seem like a pretty casual guy. I said, yeah. What was that? I said, well, I'm, I'm praying to my heavenly father. I'm praying to the Lord, the yin and the yang. The, are, are you kidding? And he said, oh, do you think you are pulling one over on God? Seminary is going to be a good experience for you, man. By the way, Wayne Schmidt, my first professor, is the general superintendent today of the Wesleyan Church. He's awesome. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 24, please listen as we hear the word of God. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you do not quench the spirit do not despise prophecy but test everything hold fast what is good abstain from every evil now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So pray. It's a relationship. What's prayer? What, what does he expect from me? Are you intimidated by prayer? No. You get a little anxious sometimes. Do you wonder what you should be doing? Is there, is there a secret formula? Are we supposed to glorify him first and then do other stuff? How does prayer work? I want to give you the FYI to help you prepare as you walk through prayer. These are three big thoughts of mine, FYI, for your information. The first one, the F, guess who that is? The Father. Focus on the Father. And it's being with God. It's being with the, the, the Father. It is not a religious transaction. 
Man, I remember back in the day, the first Christmas, I, I would get there and I'd say, Lord Jesus, here's, um, I will clean my room every day if I can get that train set. Right? It was a religious transaction. You figure, if I do this, then you'll do that. But that's not prayer. Prayer is a loving relationship, being with your Father in heaven who loves you. Jesus Christ's disciples. Okay, now think about this. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're walking around with him for a ministry for three and a half years while he's on the planet. And you see Jesus Christ, you know, do some things like, oh, I don't know, rid a holy, rid an evil spirit. Okay. Heal a leper. Raise the dead. And you can ask him a question. You know what the disciples asked? Jesus Christ? Teach us how to pray. That's what the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. Not rid of evil spirits, not heal the sick, not raise the dead, but teach us how to pray. The Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Here's Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Jesus tells us to focus on the Father. Jesus told the people to pray for, to pray our Father. Now, stay with me. This is shocking at the time. Are you kidding me? This is shocking. For many of them, this is completely offensive. That kind of talk was one of the reasons that Jesus was arrested and crucified. I mean, Jesus, humanly speaking, was not crucified for the stuff that he did. He was crucified because of who he said he was. I am the Son of, the, of God. I and the, and the Father are one. Jesus is saying here, if you put your faith in me, you too can call God your Father, and you too can become his beloved child. And in biblical times, people would not even say the word of God because it was too holy. The primary name for God in biblical times was Yahweh. Scribes couldn't even write Yahweh. They had to write this symbol. If any of you have Jewish friends and they send you a text and they want to say God, they will say G and they'll have two lines after it. They won't even write it today. It's too holy. And here's Jesus Christ, the son of a Jewish carpenter, gaining prominence, a rabbi, and he calls God Father. And not only does he call him Father, but in Aramaic he calls him Abba. And Abba means Daddy. That's what little kids say to their Daddy. And if you believe in me and you trust in me, you too can become a child of God. You too can call the Almighty, the Holy of Holy, one day Daddy. Everybody is shocked and appalled. And here's what Jesus is getting at. Prayer is not a transaction. It's a relationship. It's activation. It's a loving relationship between you and your heavenly Father. And when many of us think about that relationship, we don't think about it correctly. We don't think about it the way Jesus taught. We think it's kind of a performance-based, you know, punishments. Hey, if I'm good, he'll kind of tally you up, and then, you know, at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, you go, yep, all right. We'll let him uh, not get a flat tire on this one. We'll let that car last another bit. I mean, you think that God's either going to punish you or he's going to reward you based on how you act. A lot of people think that, Right? It's not about what you do. It's about what has already been done for you. Jesus says, no, this relationship. He says, pray like this. Our, oh man, we got to hear that one again. 
are amen right now think about your earthly fathers i mean we require a whole bunch of stuff from our earthly fathers and i as an earthly father try to have discipline it's not about punishment and and reward at least it shouldn't be (laughs) sometimes it's about wanting to have this loving relationship with my beautiful little girl and with our children so that she will trust me, so we can train her up and we can prepare her for the days ahead. This is how our Heavenly Father loves us. This is how he loves you. He wants a trusting relationship with you, and you gotta communicate. Anyone been to marriage counseling or any kind of counseling? Are you communicating well? Right? You gotta communicate with your Heavenly Father. Not repeat prayers. Think about everything that you would wish that your father here on earth would give you or could have given you the demands you put on your father. And your heavenly Abba loves you even more than that, far beyond that. He cares for you. He wants this amazing relationship with you. Oh, and here's proof. Major prophet. Isaiah, another reading from today, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. By the way, Jesus will say this 500 years later in Nazareth. Another sermon for another day. Because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners. What God wants with you, your heavenly Abba, is a personal relationship. He wants you to be a child of God. He wants to love on you, to walk you, to walk in that assurance. It's not a religious transaction. It is a loving exchange with your heavenly father, your heavenly Abba. F-Y-I, the F is focus on the father. Here comes the Y. (laughs) Yourself. Oh, yourself. Let's talk about me, right? Hey, if you ever get in an uncomfortable situation, if you're at a dinner party or anything like that, just turn the conversation around and tell that per- ask that person a question. Have them talk about themselves. People's favorite subjects is themselves. They want to tell you all about themselves. What does this mean? You can't fake it with God. Hey, don't even try it. God cannot have a relationship with who you are pretending to be. That person doesn't exist. You should just be yourself with God. (laughs) Don't pray like I did in seminary. Lord, who is that? He can't have a relationship with that person. He didn't create that person. Jesus taught that that we're to become more like little children, not childish, not immature, but more like little children, childlike with that faith, right? We're basing our faith, our hope on the resurrection. Santa Claus is coming to town. Realize that's how God created Adam and Eve naked and unashamed. All right, here we go. We're going to deep a little, dig a little bit deeper here now. You know, it's impossible for you to disappoint God as a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, disappointment is about unmet expectations Right? When, you disappoint, when, when you're disappointed in somebody, it's because you expected one thing and they did another thing. Okay. God knows all of your sins. <laughs> Sorry. He knows the sins that you've committed. He knows the sins 
that you're going to commit. And he knows the sins that you don't even know that you're going to commit. That's the omnipotence of God. Stay with me here. God transcends time. Okay. He created time, which means God lives outside of time. 2,000 years before you even existed, God made a way for you through the person of Jesus Christ. So you cannot possibly disappoint a being that knows the future. Last week, Pastor Cindy, and today in our Gospel of John, we hear how he made a way. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. Jesus is coming. Get ready. He's telling you what you do. D dive into your Torah. Old Testament. Pretty much the Old Testament. And then let's go. First Peter 5. Clothe yourselves Close yourselves, all of you. Anyone know the next word in this? With oh, humility. Humility towards one another. To be proud is to be dishonest. To not be authentic is to be in opposition of God. Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, humble yourself therefore. The biblical def definition of humility, by the way, is honesty. Pride. Oh, pride. Pride. is about pretending. Sermon for another day. We hear a lot about pride. Humility is all about reality. It means not faking it. It means getting it real. The only way to experience the real, true love of God is to be courageous enough to be the real you. All of it. I am a mess. And he knows it. Be yourself when you talk to God. You, you don't fake it. He can't love who you're pretending to be. That person doesn't exist. You talk to him about your thoughts. Yeah, even the ugly ones. Talk to him about your feelings. Express your gratitude, your joys, your frustrations. He knows. He can handle it. He's a big boy. He's God. That might be what's resonating with you today. FYI, focus on the Father. Why is yourself, be yourself, and I, here we go, guys, invite him to everything. Oh, boy. Everything, especially those Christmas parties with those people you do not want to be with, go, you know what, God, come on. <laughs> you take this, oh, she's coming over. You take this one, God, right? If you're like, oh, pastor, you know, there's some, there's some stuff out there in my life that I, uh, I don't really want to invite God to that one. Hmm. We just, we, we just, lose his invitation in the mail. Here, let me tell you what. Then you probably don't need to be doing that or you probably don't need to be being there. The reason that he doesn't want you to do that or you get that feeling down in your life, heart, and soul that maybe you should not be doing that is because God loves you 
And he's not trying to bum you out. He's not trying to ruin your life. He's trying to bless you because he loves you. He's your Abba, your daddy. You invite him to everything, even if it's something that he's not excited about. Invite him there so he can redeem you, so he can restore you, so you can repent, so you can heal. Oh, we made it back to 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. Pray as you do. Pray as you go on your way all day. I mean, there's moments in your life where you got to get away. Jesus did that every morning. And if you talk to me, I'm going to say, before you get out of the bed in the morning, Pray. I'm not talking about those times. I'm talking about praying all the time. Now, your posture and prayer of your body is not nearly as important as the posture of your heart. Yes, you should pray while you're driving, especially when you're on I-95. But don't close your eyes. <laughs> Involve God in everything. You're giving him your attention. When you go to school, when you're home, when things are happening in your life, you pray all day as you go on your way. You know what's really cool? Put your hands on someone when you pray. That is a, a blessing to them. Focus on the Father. Be yourself. Invite him to everything. You know what? Sometimes... God does not meet our expectations so he can exceed them. Bold prayers honor God. And there it is. You're armed with information. You're armed with activation. You gotta implement it, you gotta use it. We are anticipating, this is the season of, of Advent. The goal of this church service, the goal of us coming together to serve and glorify the Lord is not edutainment. The goal is that we get God's information from his word and we apply it to our lives. Information with application leads to transformation. So I want to encourage you. Practice it. The more you do it, the more your heavenly father, your Abba, will grow closer to you. Pray and be more rooted and established in God's love. It's Advent. It's Advent. Season of anticipation. And activation. Are you ready? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this worship service. And Father God, we thank you for the season of anticipation and the season of activation. Lord, we thank you for biblical scripture and we thank you for the blessing of being able to communicate, to, to have a relationship with you. Father, compel me to focus on you, to be myself and invite you to everything. For I know that anticipation and activation brings you glory and praise. We lift this up in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's children say, Amen.